what I'm going to do is just introduce the report quickly and the context very, very quickly, because I know that the discussion may lead to, you know, uh, different tangents. So I don't want to dwell on details, but we're here to answer questions um, during the discussion period. So this report was written by, by a multidisciplinary team. Uh, you can see the names in the yellow box there. My name is Sarah, and we've got uh, uh, Jacopo and Giacomo here today with us. So I'm just going to introduce. Then Jacopo is going to frame the problem. He's going to describe how we frame the problem. Um, and he's going to describe the pathways that were analyzed. And then Giacomo is going to take over for the carbon accounting part. OK. So very quickly, um, the biodiversity strategy was adopted in May last year. And in that the strategy, there was a paragraph that we read uh, after the adoption with you uh, saying JRC would produce this study on the sustainability of forest biomass uh, for bioenergy. And so we, we weren't sure if that was really true, but it uh, turns out that yes, we were supposed to do that. So we put a team together and uh, produced this report. And <clears throat> what was novel with this study or the reason why it was, let's say, commissioned through the biodiversity strategy is because the focus on, on bioenergy had always been, you know, uh, you know carbon accounting, whereas now we had to put it into a biodiversity context. So it's a little bit different. Okay. So Sarah, so, excuse me. There is a black box on the right of your screen. I don't know why, because you see, uh, thank you, Jack. So okay. you see. Yes, uh, I know. That you can with my, okay, okay. that's much better. Thanks. Okay. Thank you very much. <laughs> So very quickly, um, uh, what the JRC has been doing for a few years now is what we call a wood resource balance and, and wood float uh, for the EU. So of course we do it at country level and then we, we sum uh, for, for the purposes of this study. This is all 2015 data because as you know, forest uh, statistics are not very timely. And so it was a bit embarrassing to have to report this, but that's what we had. Actually, the, um, some data came out at the end of last year to, would, that would have allowed us to produce numbers to 2017, but it doesn't help very much <laughs> between 2015 and 2017, and we, we might have made some mistakes in the process. And this is EU28, by the way, so the UK is in here. Uh, and the first message that we give in the report is that there's there's a gap between the sources and the uses. And then we may discuss uh, our, our our methodology, and we know that the gap is also due to uncertainty, also in the, the coefficients that we're applying. And uh, this is something that's absolutely, um, we're trying to be transparent about that. But the gap is significant. I mean, we're talking about almost 13% unaccounted sources. So uh, that, that was something we felt we should report. The other thing that we wanted to show was, uh, well, the wood flows. So I think you've all seen this, but it was important also for policymakers, who, the target audience of this, uh, this science to policy report, to show that there is a massive amount of circularity in forest-based industries, and that it was important to show that, you know, uh, um, woody biomass for bioenergy comes also from or a half of uh, of it comes from. Um, from this, these secondary sources. So it was important to emphasize that. Okay, then we can talk more about this in detail, but I think you're more interested in, in Jacopo and Giacomo's part, uh, considering the audience. But the point is that it's really complex. We took a lot of data sources, um, switched them around, changed the units, applied coefficients, and these are the results so that we could put everything together into one picture. And then we have um, more uses than, than sources in our resource balance for EU28. We show a, a breakdown in detail of the wood use for bioenergy. Okay, so that's this picture that's also in the report that we can go into detail later. But the, the message is about 14% is uncategorized. That's just because of the way the reporting is set up. Um, so it's not, uh, let's say, malicious, uh, un unwritten, you know, hiding of uh, reporting, probably. It's just that's the way the reporting is set up. So we can't, a lot of wood is not categorized or woody biomass is not categorized for bioenergy. And the other thing I wanted to show, if you look at the lower graph, is that you see that um, the industrial round wood, so the removals for industrial, uh, industrial round wood, sort of stable, it, it took a dip, it took a dive with the, the economic crisis, but the removals for uh, pure wood have always uh, been on the rise. So they're less affected by 
let's say these, these uh, market shocks. So now I'm going to stop. Again, we're here to answer questions, but I think that the next part might be more of interest to you. So I'll leave to uh, Jacopo control of the screen. I guess I just have to stop sharing, right? And yes. then let you take over. Yes. Can you see my screen now? Yeah. Yes. Oh, good. Thank okay. you. Okay. Hi. Good, good morning, everybody. Just just a premise. Uh, my, my dog's very sick and I've been up all night, so I'm going to be short and quite blunt, but we are on the chat mouse rules, so it should be fine. Uh, let me minimize this. So before I go into the uh, analysis that we did for biodiversity impacts, which was my, my core topic in this report, uh, there was another part that we discussed in the report, which uh, I think is quite fundamental, but it wasn't really picked up that much. So I'm going to start with that. And that's the issues that we have seen with the current problem framing when we discuss about uh, uh, forest biology sustainability governance in the EU. So we have defined this as a wicked problem in the, in the report. And the two main issues that we've seen and that I feel they are not uh, discussed in a, in a comprehensive way or in an explicit way when we, when we debate these, these issues. The first one is indeterminacy. So the debate for almost a decade now, and most of the participants in this workshop, I mean, we have been discussing this, I think, since me personally, since 2011, 12, and most of you for even more. Um, but the, the discussion has been focused on answering the question, does forest bioenergy mitigate climate change? And what we postulate is that this question has no answer. It is not simply uncertain, it's just indeterminate because it is dependent on modeling approaches and assumptions about the hypothetical future. So authors might come to equally valid but opposite answers or very different answers depending on, assumpt on the assumptions chosen. So similar, uh, we've seen this when, when we were reviewing the, for this report, similar evidence bases, different um, conclusions. So, but this issue has become an epistemic trap in which we all fell. And we've been going around this topic for 10 years and never getting out of it, because I, I think that we are forgetting the second point, which is uh, the strong presence of uh, diverging ethical perspectives in this debate. So the assumptions that we choose in our modeling and in our analysis will align consciously or unconsciously with the worldviews and ethical values of, of us, of, our, of the authors, because uh, as much as we say that science is neutral and it is, uh, in many cases, when we talk about external interests, for instance, or economic interests, that's debatable, but let's say that we are all independent of that, but we cannot be independent from our own values and worldviews. So you might dispute this second point, but for me, what I've seen is that usually uh, a strong support for a large expansion of Bayanji usually come from uh, authors and stakeholders with a more anthropocentric view of human nature relationship while opposers of bioenergy, which are quite strong in their views as well, are usually aligned with the more conservation and environmental protection values. So there are different concerns and different, very different definitions of sustainable bioenergy. So this heavy ethical component uh, has been completely ignored in the discussion. So we'll be trying to go on relying on science to solve an answer, to find the answer, which uh, in many cases uh, is, is simply based on ethical differences. So it cannot be found through scientific and quantification method. And this has led to the polarization and the controversy that we see nowadays. And that's why we, we called for a detoxified framing in the report. And we, we have by no means all the solutions. Uh, actually, stay tuned. We, we, we are working with some people in, in this field trying to uh, produce something about this, but some of the answer, some of the potential elements that we see for the detoxified framing are, first of all, starting to realize that the question is not whether to achieve greenhouse gas targets, but rather how. And, and that's, I think, a very important part. And that's what we try to uh, describe also with the um, uh, red tool and LULUCF interaction that Giacomo will present later on. There are intrinsic ethical aspects in the discussion that should be made explicit. There are no right or wrong answers, and we should stop looking for the right answer because it simply doesn't exist. And our point is that science won't solve this debate, but can help with the problem boundaries. So by acting as science arbiter, uh, for instance, with impact assessment of specific policy options, or by answering a different set of questions. So rather than does forest biology mitigate climate change, but under which condition does forest biology mitigate climate change? 
uh, or by presenting other uncomfortable knowledge uh, that might have been overlooked in the current problem framing. So this said, that's the spirit with which we went into this, this study. So under which conditions can we, can we have um, pathways and forest by energy that mitigate climate change and uh, does not affect negatively biodiversity? So when we, went, when we go more specifically into the problem framing of the report, uh, we start from a, from a perspective that forest ecosystems in Europe and around the world are generally in poor condition. This was found by our colleagues also in GRC from the MICE group and the MICE report. And we know that bioenergy, if we want to increase the use of uh, forest bioenergy, this will inevitably place additional demand of wood, uh, of wood on forest ecosystems, causing likely changes in forest management practice, being this directly or indirectly. We also know that bioenergy is very peculiar among other renewable energy sources because it's at the nexus of the climate and biodiversity emergencies. This is a key point for me. I know that we are here talking about climate, but we try to make this very explicit in the report. A lot has been said and written about the carbon impacts of forest bioenergy. If any of you, most, many of you were participating in the process back in 2016, the impact assessment of the RED2 has a lot of information. We have annexes even talking about the biogeophysical aspects of climate change, uh, impacts of forest bioenergy. It has a lot of information. That information was all taken into account when the previous uh, political decision for the RED2 was taken. And so for, for this report, we decided to do no additional research on, on carbon impacts because we, we thought that it's so established that, that our understanding and knowledge on this, on this aspect. Uh, what we decided to do was to clarify how the RED2 and LULUCF regulation interact, which was actually very much appreciated. Uh, however, we noticed that uh, the bioenergy literature lacks an assessment of potential impacts on forest biodiversity and ecosystems. So there is the risk of promoting bioperversities. So pathways that we know might mitigate climate change and carbon uh, emissions, but at the other hand uh, could place additional um, risks on forest. So uh, the method that we chose, there is no clear quantitative method for impact assessment by diversity in ecosystems condition. There is no clear cut, uh, let's say LCA, quantitative method that can give us a clear number, even though numbers are never clear. Uh, so we used a literature review and a synthesis to bridge the disciplinary divide basically between ecological literature and bioenergy literature. We focus on three intervention and I know there's gonna be a lot of uh, questions about that. So we chose three interventions, removal of logging residues, afforestation, and conversion of natural forest to plantation. And we assess their impacts on ecosystems through several um, parameters that you can see here on the, on the right. So I want to go straight into this uh, slide. Why did we choose this intervention? So uh, we did an analysis back a few months ago and uh, where we tried to give a framework of potential changes that might be led by an increase in uh, bioenergy demand. And uh, our work stemmed a lot from the work of Robert uh, Matthews, which I think is here uh, back from 2015. I, I re uh, regard that work, which actually already informed the RED2 uh, as one of the best in the, in the field. So uh, that work, in my opinion, showed very clearly that the, we cannot distinguish simply between um, uh, impacts between, uh, for feedstocks, but we really need to look at the whole management. And so we looked at potential changes uh, that could be led by bioenergy demand. And we decided to look at interventions that are change oriented. So we wanted to look at interventions that provide additional biomass, because we know that if we are not providing additional, I mean, this is established already since I think searching in 2008, uh, we want to, uh, we will have to supply additional biomass. And if we want to do that, that's the, uh, we need to look at how the way, ways to do that. And among the potential changes that can be driven, could be driven by an increase in bioenergy demand, uh, we looked at more aspirational or desirable uh, pathways. So even, uh, I mean, we, we have this criticism a lot that uh, nobody is doing afforestation, nobody is converting natural forest to plantation, which I would object to that. But let's say that that's okay, that it's correct that it's not happening now. Uh, that is something that is definitely looked forward for the future and in an aspirational, desirable way. So that's why we wanted to look at, at to identify potential bioperversities. Then when it comes to we, why we haven't looked at more traditional management, that's because it's already been studied. I mean, if it's traditional management in forests, it's probably going on for 50, 60, 100 years. So the existing 
um, status, ecological and sink stock of forest is already the result of traditional management. So we, we saw uh, not much value in looking backwards, but we wanted to look forward. Uh, and we clearly state in the report that other interventions should be looked into, especially we mentioned copies, uh, that could be an interesting pathway. So the way we did it, because we had so much, uh, we, we went through a literature review that we decided to synthesize that in a qualitative assessment. So we defined some pathways archetypes, uh, and then we um, assessed the potential risks on ecosystems and biodiversity. So we have high risk, neutral positive, medium high risk, and medium low risk. Uh, these categories are uh, basically defined, if you look at the medium high pathways that can potentially have negative impacts on biodiversity, so they shouldn't be taken for granted, and the, but the actual impacts depends on many co-founding variables. Uh, and the medium low risk is something that we feel like it could be taken for granted that it was positive, and instead it shouldn't. It should be investigated at local level. When it comes to carbon emissions, again, I'm not going to go into many details because I think everybody is aware of, of the issues we have been discussing for 10 years, temporal dimension, a potential payback time, carbon depth. So the only thing we did was to take the data from the literature and then uh, categorize them into very broad beans, short term, likely medium term, likely medium term, long term. These are very broad categories because as you all well know, we cannot give a simple number for a simple pathway. And this is the figure that we came up with, where we place uh, the various pathways on various quadrants. Uh, what I think is interesting, I'm going to go one by one, uh, but rather quickly. Um, I, for me, it, it's coming from my perspective, it was already very positive to see that we have win-win solutions. I was not giving that for granted, uh, but we do have win-win solutions. So we have uh, pathways that use uh, slash. So when we talk, I saw some confusion because we defined fine woody debris and coarse woody debris in the report. Uh, we actually defined them quite clearly, but apparently it wasn't clear enough. So when we talk about fine woody debris, most of the literature talks about slash, so branches, uh, tops, and branches, uh, not necessarily of uh, millimeter dimensions, but up to centimeters dimensions. Um, those slash between below certain, certain thresholds is, uh, is a win-win solution. I think we knew that. I didn't see that as a surprising result. Uh, we see a forestation of former agricultural land with mixed forest uh, should be, uh, is, a, is a win win solution, something that will be and should be promoted now with the 3 billion trees of forestation under the biodiversity strategy. We also have some loose loose pathways that are, I, I didn't think they were going to be surprising for anybody, like conversion of uh, uh, primary forest to plantation or using coarse woody debris for, for uh, energy. So let's say snags or uh, standing dead trees for bioenergy, uh, those are, have a high ecological role and they take centuries to decompose. So um, other, other loose loose the convention of natural forest to plantations, these are always negative for the ecosystems is, is terrible. And for carbon, there are more and more studies showing that it's not uh, really a positive solution. Uh, then we have an in-between be in uh, pathways that I wanted to focus, which are stumps. The stumps are very uh, tricky. If you take an ecosystem uh, where you have high or faster decay rates, then you might shift uh, towards, uh, sorry, up, upwards. And if you have uh, ecosystems where stumps are not uh, relevant because you have other amounts of dead wood, then you may shift even left. So uh, stumps are, are, are tricky um, pathways. Then there are other trade-offs on the left quadrant is less important. On the potential biperversities, uh, you have a forestation of grasslands and anthropogenic heathlands. This is something that maybe for bioenergy is, uh, could be important in the future, but definitely it's important now for the biodiversity strategy. Um, and then you have, uh, uh, I, I find this interesting, the 17, a forestation of agricultural land with monoculture plantation. I thought this was a silver bullet. This was a, a straight shoot, but apparently literature teaches that it's not like that, that it, it might have even uh, detrimental uh, impacts on the, on the ecosystems. So my key message is because I'm a bit out of time, win-win options exist, and I don't think that's a given. Uh, the risk of lose-lose pathways might be mitigated by national guidelines and voluntary standards, but we need to verify that these are fit for purpose and the precautionary principles should apply, in, in our opinion. Uh, this is everything that we have said in terms of policy because this is everything that we have analyzed in terms of uh, pathways. We didn't mean to cover the whole evidence basis. People took it as if we should have. 
uh, but that was not our goal. So uh, impacts of scale, for instance, we did not assess. So how could we give any recommendation on that? Again, the study of Robert Miklas is also here. They did a lot of work in 2016. I think it's still valid uh, to assess impacts of scale. Uh, and then we think more research is needed. Uh, we can discuss about this later on. And I conclude uh, my speech here and I will be here for questions. Uh, I'm gonna stop sharing. Yeah, there you go, Giacomo. Hello, can you see the, the screen? Um, yeah, looks Gar good. You put really it in presentation mode. Yeah, sure. Um, Lovely, thank you. Yes, yeah. good. Um, okay, um, to continue, uh, this uh, uh, figure outlines the criteria that forest biomass used for bioenergy must comply with according to Red 2 uh, regulation. Um, now, the implementing act of this regulation will be soon uh, published, and a debate is uh, ongoing on the possible revision of that, especially in the light of the greater climate ambition uh, for the EU in 2030, which will be minus 55 in 2030 compared to 1990, compared to the current minus 40. I mean, I, I will not go in detail about this criteria, but just to mention that there are sustainability uh, uh, criteria that refers to the health of ecosystem, carbon accounting criteria, and greenhouse gas invent, uh, criteria, which has to do with the minimum threshold for saving. And the aim is, in this case, is to promote most efficient pathways. Here, we will focus on the second one, on the, the carbon uh, accounting part. First of all, uh, greenhouse gas emissions from bioenergy. We try to collect uh, available information. And uh, in the graph here, you see various lines. The uh, blue solid line is what comes from as a memo item in the greenhouse gas inventory under the energy uh, sector. But this does not include only forest biomass, include also other sources of biomass. So we applied, according to literature, various uh, adjustment factors, and we come up with the, uh, the dash line, which is uh, quite close to what uh, the, the GRC in this report estimates based on the wood resource balance. So overall, in the EU, uh, in 2015, the burning of uh, wood for bioenergy emitted around three, uh, 360 million tons of CO2 and displaced, in the sense that if, if you see the, the energy mix uh, in, in Europe also with, with some uh, approximation, displaced an amount uh, of, uh, um, of emission that uh, around to, to 60 to 70. But we cannot draw attention because we cannot draw a conclusion just because of, the, of this number. Uh, any conclusion which should take into account which wood is, is used for that. <clears throat> and some of this information has been collected in the GRC report and summarized here. In 2015, the origin of wood for bioenergy was 20% primary wood, uh, stem wood, at least half from copies, especially from Mediterranean countries. 70% was still primary wood, but other like treetops, branches, and so on. Nearly 50% was secondary sources, so byproducts of wood industry, uh, bark, past cons consumer wood, and also pellets, important pellets uh, have been included here. But what is uh, important and worrying is that 14% uh, is uncategorized. Um, we couldn't really allocate that. Uh, so the, the message is that the majority of forest energy in the EU is based on residues. And this is, if you want, positive, but there is room for improvement in terms of uh, a positive climate impact. Then the, the about 30% increase from 2005 to 2018 mainly is associated to uh, fuel wood, including carpets. And what is a worrying message is the large uncertainties in, in statistics, statistics <clears throat> that prevents to assign a high confidence on any conclusion on the uh, goodness, on the, the good or negative climate impact of covered bioenergy. So we see, okay, it must come from bioenergy, but must can, 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 is not enough if you want to uh, provide a sound message to, to policymakers. 
So where the carbon uh, impact of bioenergy is accounted? Emission from bioenergy, as you know, well, are not counted at the point of biomass combustion because already accounted in Lucia as a change in carbon stock reported annually in the greenhouse inventory. This approach follows what uh, is recommended by the PC and by UNFCC you know, guidance for inventories. And the aim is mainly to guarantee a practicable approach and avoid double counting. I mean, the asterisks, the, the long text in the asterisks essentially try to explore uh, if, if, uh, if we decide hypothetically to uh, account for the emissions in the energy sector, what should we do to avoid double counting in the UCF sector? Well, to me, it would be quite a nightmare because, as you know, when you burn something, this something may come from a, a harvest that occurred a few months before, a few years before, or a few decades before. And to avoid double counting, in theory, you should retrospectively uh, correct the, the LUCEF accounting done in the years before. I mean, it's something that I, I can't really imagine as, as, uh, as uh, practicable and possible. How, after we have seen uh, um, where it is accounted, how LUCEF accounts for emission from, from bioenergy. Uh, okay, I leave you uh, maybe later the, the, the complex detail of, of the image. I'm not going to the, the details. But as you know, the, the LUCF, the main tool uh, that LUCF use for accounting uh, changes in forest is the course forest reference level, which are country determined projection um, of greenhouse gas fluxes against which uh, the future fluxes will be compared with. Uh, you can see here uh, the, the blue line is the historical sink. And uh, the red line is the forest reference level as determined by countries after a long process of technical assessment that lasted two years. And if future sink will be smaller than the reference level, uh, there will be debit. Means that uh, the, any uh, debit will have to be compensated by extra emission reduction in other sectors. If the sink will be greater, uh, there will be credit up to a given level that can be used other sectors to meet their respective uh, target. According to the reference level, the, the, how the, the reference level has been conceived is to account the impact of any change in management and wood use relative to the historical period, which has been fixed 2009. So any, the impact of any change in management will be reflected in climate accounts. This means that trade-off exists, of course, in harvesting for bioenergy, because if you see here, the more you harvest for bioenergy, the more you will uh, save emissions from fossil fuel and you will reach your renewable energy target. But this will, the trade-off is that if, if this extra harvest will uh, put you in a situation to have uh, a debit, then, then the, 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 the benefit that you, you had through using bioenergy in, uh, and re replacing fossil fuel uh, will, will vanish. <clears throat> so, claims that AU assumes bioenergy as carbon neutral, which are still quite often made, are outdated, at least outdated. These statements were true maybe years ago, but not anymore now. However, the way reference level has been defined means that not all, the reference level do, do not count all the impact of increasing harvest, uh, because this decrease in the sink that you see here from the blue line the red line here is associated to age structure dynamics. <clears throat> Essentially, these, uh, the, the, the rationale be, be, uh, behind the reference level that uh, the aim was not to penalize countries for their forests getting older, which means penalizing countries for choices made by our grandfathers when they, they cut or harvested uh, um, uh, their, their forest. So <clears throat> uh, the first reference level accounts for the impact of changes in management compared to the past, but not, does not uh, count for the impact of age structure, which is embedded in the reference level. Uh, it is worth noticing that compared to the previous version of reference level under Kyoto, the, the reference level under Kyoto was much smaller sink, was around 250. So the current reference level is about 60 million greater sink than what we had in Kyoto. And this, in my view, shows how big, how a big step reference level is compared to what we had before. Of course, as you have seen maybe in the report, 
we even suggest possible future simp drastic simplification of uh, Lucef regulation, uh, but we, we can leave it for the, the debate. So essentially, according to reference level, <coughs> countries predicted themselves a 16 increase in harvest in the period 2021-2025 compared to the reference uh, period, and, uh, uh, and uh, which corresponds to a 17% decrease in the sink. Uh, why Lucias per se should encourage climate policy pathway per se, because should should encourage a climate smart use uh, of uh, of uh, bioenergy, per se does not guarantee that forest bioenergy contribute to climate change mitigation. There are risks. There are risks of poor communication, mismatch of incentive that can produce an intended outcome. For example, that too much bioenergy is used with negative climate uh, impact. Uh, this is the, the the two points here. Summarize the, the kind of incentives that exist in, in red and UCF. So, red two, through the zero uh, rating accounting and uh, considering bio, biomass as renewable, actually in practice <coughs> gives <coughs> a short term incentive to economic operator to make an increasing use of uh, forest bioenergy. So, there is an increasing, uh, uh, stimulates the demand of wood. This can be good or not. On the other side, UCF. Uh, uh, essentially send a medium term signal to countries and say, look, if you harvest too much and this harvest uh, is not compensated by extra growth or greenhouse gas saving in other sectors, then uh, this extra harvest from energy will put you in a situation of having debit in UCF. So be careful because this debit will have to be compensated by extra emission in other sectors. There could be a mismatch of these incentives because these these uh, these messages are, are have different time frame and are given to different uh, actors. So I open a small parenthesis here because we are very often asked how the harvest in the biology report compares to the uh, the paper appeared in Nature by Chiker in Italy. And here the, the incentive the intention is not to put. Uh, uh, for the benzene on fires, but actually to offer some possible clarification and possibly to detoxify a little bit the debate. Well, th there is a difference uh, in, in the trend in the, in, two, in the report and the Ciccherini paper, simply because the paper of Ciccherini measure clear cuts, not total harvest. Uh, we have to admit uh, that this was unfortunately not clear in the abstract of that paper. It is expl explained several times in the text and the supplementary information quantify this for each country. So quantify the likely impact of clear felling, which is what our method essentially detected compared to the total harvest of the country. For example, drawing from this table in the supplementary information, one can draw a conclusion that at the EU level, it seems that about 40, 50% of harvest appear to be from clear cuts or final felling which is the quantitative impact of that finding. So this is the main graph in the Ciccherini uh, paper uh, with uh, uh, the increase expressed in area and in biomass. So unfortunately, also for probably poor communication in the paper itself, this uh, uh, increase in biomass has been perceived in that way. So it has been perceived that we assumed we, we capture all the harvest and we, we say that whole harvest increased by 79% and reaching uh, a value of, uh, of uh, uh, total harvest around 800 uh, million cubic meter. The problem is that of this, this perceived, perceived increase in harvest is that it compares totally incomparable quantities because it compares tons of clear cut fellings over bark, which is our study here, versus cubic meters of total removals under bark, which is country statistics here. I mean, nothing is correct in this comparison because tons is not uh, cubic meters, clear cut filing is not total removals, over bark is not under bark. And uh, we, we are sorry for this uh, misunderstanding that has driven for too much time the, the discussion. And it seems that um, unfortunately, again, it was not clear enough for, for the readers the unit of this graph here. Unit is uh, tons of bias. And it's 
something that everybody, any of you can do is just multiply this by two to obtain cubic meter, approximately by two to convert from tons cubic meter to just tons of minus to, to uh, cubic meters. And the result of that, multiplying this line here by two, you would obtain cubic meters that you can to compare with counter statistics of removals and even better with fillings. So here we are starting to have an apple with apple comparison. And from based on that, uh, you see that this, this graph here on the right is pretty different from the perceived uh, message from, from the paper. But this is the original data, so I'm not manipulating the original data. So when I like, we like comparison is done, <clears throat> the result of GRC looks plausible, like compatible with country statistics, but it's not finished yet. So where is the Jersey report? Well, Jersey report comes here with the blue lines. Uh, these blue lines are use updated uh, data from filings from countries for the official statistics from, from countries. Plus takes into account the statistics of wood use. As Sarah said before, according to country statistics of wood use, uh, th there is a discrepancy of about 20% with wood uh, removal. So, uh, the GRC report gave a minimum maximum on, on failing here. So this part, the difference between the blue line and the red line is what is not included in the GRC study because it's not clear that our small scale forest activities, which as we clearly indicated in the text, are not detected with the method, with satellite method that we used. So essentially when latest statistics and reliable statistics, including would use, uh, are used, the GRC results are well below uh, country statistics. This that, that does not even take into account something that will soon appear in a comment in nature that will be published in a couple of weeks now and our rebuttal on the fact that there has been an undocumented change in algorithm 2015. And this has an impact uh, on the increase in harvest that, that we reported. So I do not anticipate here in two weeks will be further clarified. So this increase in harvest is the original one. If you take into account the impact of the undocumented change in algorithm, this would shift a little bit down. But coming back to our point and conclusion on, on carbon accounting. So as uh, Jacopo said, there are different viewpoints and, and concern on the impact uh, on, on, uh, on bioenergy. And many of them are, are fully legitimate. So far, most suggestions to address the concern against bioenergy were are listed here with possible uh, counter arguments. So one, one argument, as I said, stop considering bioenergy as carbon neutral. This is, I mean, I, I'm, I hope that this is now clear that bioenergy cannot be assumed as carbon neutral in the EU climate framework. Uh, another argument, count emission from bioenergy at the point of combustion. Again, this is not practical. It is not a constructive uh, suggestion. Then other possible suggestion, legally restrictive feedback to be used for bioenergy, for example, residues only or put a cap. These are fully legitimate um, proposal, but this has been already analyzed in the impact assessment of RED2 and were concluded at the time that it's difficult to implement that and are likely ineffective. I mean, reassessing this is legitimate now, of course, but it was outside the scope of the GRC report. Another one is stop considering woody biomass as a renewable source of energy. I mean, this of course would eliminate the risk of negative impacts, but would also eliminate the opportunity of positive impacts. So the, 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 the point that I want to make is that risk of negative climate impact exists, as also Jacob said before. Reducing the risk, at least in part, is possible by proper implementation of existing EU national legislation. If this is enough or not, or if a proper implementation is possible or not, it's a policy decision. It's not something for science. So as Jacopo said, science cannot settle, provide all the answer. I think I'm a bit allergic when I hear from both sides, from different sides, say science says this or science says that. I mean, science may, may say many things, but cannot set the final words on, on, on uh, biology at the end. It's much uh, a risk management issue, which is in the hands of policymaker in our view. So I think that uh, the, the policymaker has to take the final decision, but still uh, scientific community has some, an, a very important role. And a constructive contribution 
in our view, for example, could imply integrated modeling of all forest sector options, not only the carbon storage forest in HRVP, but also material and bioenergy all take into account, take into account biodiversity, health, and socioeconomic in impacts. And this would help to refine and complement general principle we all agree with, like prioritizing the residues, circular use of wood, and to find uh, help finding at country and local scale will win a loose loose option. From the countryside, I think it would be it's absolutely uh, crucial to get a greater awareness of the interlinkages between red and loose earth. Sometimes we, we find that the, the National Energy and Climate Plan assume an increase in uh, in the use of biomass for for bioenergy without even taking into account the impact that it has to loose earth. This is uh, this. Is Absolutely wrong. I mean, countries have to be aware that if you cut more in, uh, in uh, to for energy purpose, they will have to pay a price in UCF. And this is thanks to the rational club. So the, the country should uh, design governance tools and incentives that encourage win-win option, discourage lose-lose pathway. This again much in their hands to uh, tune the incentives which are uh, fit for purpose, and then maybe the single biggest, uh, most important message in my view, is that a timely, reliable monitoring of the use of forest by energy is fundamental. If you do not have reliable information on, uh, on, uh, on forest by energy, if you don't measure, you cannot even manage. Thank you very much.